A Democrat politician was found guilty of murder. It was a unanimous decision by the jury. I actually saw this happening yesterday on TV. It was aired on CBS. And I'm going to show you this clip. And from this one minute clip, I knew immediately that he was a Democrat politician. So here is my challenge to you. Watch this clip and see if you can figure out how I knew that this man was a Democrat. Here we go. District Court, Clark County, Nevada, State of Nevada, Plaintiff versus Robert Tellis, Defendant, Case Number C, 368935, Department Number 12, Verdict. We, the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Robert Tellis, as follows. Murder with use of a deadly weapon, victim 60 years of age or older. Guilty of first degree murder with use of a deadly weapon, victim 60 years of age or older. Special Verdict. The jury unanimously finds the murder willful, deliberate, and premeditated. The jury unanimously finds a murder was committed by means of lying in wait. The jury unanimously finds a murder was committed by means of elder abuse. Guilty of first degree murder with use of a deadly weapon, special verdict. The jury unanimously finds the murder willful, deliberate, premeditated. Okay, so did you notice the text on the Chiron? The text at the very bottom of the screen referred to him as, quote, a former Nevada politician. And that's how I knew he was a Democrat, because the media has this funny habit. Whenever a Republican is guilty of doing something, anything that could make that individual or the party looks bad, what I've noticed is that the media makes a point to put their party affiliation right in the title, right in the headline. They hammer all the time that it's a Republican politician found guilty of laundering, found guilty of an inappropriate relationship, or whatever it is. But whenever it's a Democrat, the media seemingly goes out of their way to hide the politician's political affiliation. Why do they do that? I, I'm not trying to say there's some grand conspiracy going on here. Maybe it's just the individual bias of the journalist, or maybe there is a larger bias within these organizations. But I, I actually went down that rabbit hole yesterday because I had a sneaking suspicion that it wasn't just CBS. So I Googled the case, and here's how the New York Times reported it. Former Las Vegas official convicted in a journalist murder. Now, I took this screenshot personally, and I searched the entire article for the word Democrat. Zero appearances in the entire thing. And again, I, I kept going down the Google News search results. NBC, same situation. Ex-politician Robert Tellis found guilty of murder and stabbing death of Las Vegas investigative journalist. Again, zero mentions of the word Democrat. Now, I will give kudos to CNN. I give kudos where kudos is due. They did mention his party affiliation two times in their article, but they waited until paragraph 11 to mention it for the first time. So, you know, most people don't read the entire news article. In fact, most people don't read news articles at all. What, th what happens is they see the headline and they just gather it from that, whether the headline appears in their news feed or is shared by their friends and family on social media. So the headlines are really important, really powerful in shaping a narrative. And again, CNN didn't mention it until paragraph 11. Now, I went through a whole bunch of news articles and the best, excuse me, sorry, I hit that again. The best example... Uh, or excuse me, the best reporting on this was actually from the Associated Press. So again, kudos where kudos is due. Uh, the Associated Press mentioned that he was a Democrat, not only in the image caption, but in their very first sentence in their first paragraph. So, hey, good job, Associated Press. I'll, I'll, I'll give you credit on that. So this case really is very interesting. This is Robert Tellis. He is the... Um, Clark, former Clark County public administrator in Las, uh, in Las Vegas, and he was convicted of murdering a journalist there, an investigative journalist named Jeff German. And Jeff German was essentially chronicling an alleged affair between Tellus and a staffer. But it wasn't just this inappropriate relationship. It included bullying, retaliation, and um, apparently... Uh, allegations of like stalking and stuff like that. So the case was actually really crazy to listen to. I watched, I, I, I love court proceedings and I actually watched three hours of evidence. So I, I, I did something and this is something new to the channel. I took those three hours of footage and I've essentially cut it down to five minutes of Five minutes of what I think are quote unquote the good stuff and the stuff that you'll think is interesting and really 
I think makes the case as to why he's guilty. First of all, Teles claimed that he wasn't the killer. He claimed that it was a hired assassin who went after the man. Uh, apparently, his DNA was under the victim's fingernails, which obviously is hard to get there. He accused the DNA office of planting the DNA. He... Um, what else? Oh, his shoe, the shoe from the crime scene was found underneath his couch at home and he claimed he was framed. There was, uh, his car was at the crime scene. So much, like, actually, in my mind, made a rock solid case against him. And to this day, he still claims that he's innocent. He still claims that he was framed by a professional assassin. Again, this is three hours of footage that I've cut down into five minutes of what I think are the good stuff. Um, this is something new to the channel. So if you don't like it, let me know in the comments below. Or if you do find it interesting, uh, again, let me know in the comments below because I would love to know whether I should do more stuff like this or if you're like, no, stick to your usual format. But uh, let's Take a look at this court proceeding and we'll revisit, reconvene at the very end. Um, I was listening to your testimony. I'm gonna publish states 311. I was listening to your testimony. And if I heard you correctly, many, many, many times during your direct exam or during your direct, um, you, you stated that this, this is the killer of Mr. Cameron, correct? Um, I didn't necessarily, but I'm sure it is. I mean, if I heard you correctly, you kept saying, you know, looking at the killer, this guy. I know, I know you're not saying that's me, but you don't doubt that whoever that is killed Mr. Garman. That would be fair, right? Yes. Okay. Um, you had told this jury that it, you felt like it looked like someone who knew what they were doing. Is that right? Yes, sir. You believe this was a professional hit? And that's what I believe. Okay. And, and you believe this killer is kind of almost like a, I mean, someone hired to do this job, like an assassin, essentially, right? That is what I believe, yes, sir. All right. Now, I want to take a look at this picture for a second. The, the, the assassin seems to be wearing a giant sun hat. Um, it's a pretty big hat, right? Yes, sir. It's fairly noticeable, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, you think that might attract attention? Um, I, I would think so. Okay, but this is a professional. Right. All right. And this professional is also wearing a bright orange shirt, correct? Yes, sir. Professional? Yes, sir. But wouldn't that attract attention? I, I think that's part of the reason, actually. If I, I could elaborate. No, no, no. You, you believe that professional assassins want to draw attention to themselves when they're carrying out murder. That's your testimony? When, when they're framing someone, yes, sir. So the answer to my question is yes. You believe professional assassins like to draw attention to themselves? It depends on what the nature of their goal is, and if it's to frame someone, yes, sir. So the answer to my question is yes? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So this is your assassin walking in the middle of the dead, correct? Um, my assassin? All right, Paul. This is the assassin, the killer, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Seems to have a little bit of a hitch in his getup. Yes, I, I don't know. I, and, I guess it's an opinion. And you don't disagree that that's the that's from you've seen all the footage. That's the killer's car, right? Yes, sir. It's a it's a it's a maroon Denali. Am I right? Yes, sir. You own a maroon Denali, isn't that correct? I do, sir. Yes, sir. And again, I don't know what he's doing in that video. No, I'm just using your yeah, words, no, your no, thought I, process. Absolutely. Do you believe that was all part of the plan? I do. It wasn't, it wasn't me, so... Sir, doesn't that look a little amateurish? I, I would like to think that I wouldn't use my own car if I was actually the person who did this. Well, so. it's, well doesn't it look a little amateurish to take the steps to park on the side of the street, then you forget what you dropped, probably your murder weapon, who knows, wear this goofy sun hat, a bright orange shirt. I mean, it, you really think that looks like professional killer? I, I do. Uh, again, it, okay. it wasn't me, so, okay. yes. All right. There's one thing I didn't hear you mention. The DNA. I'd like to talk. You're not disputing that your DNA is underneath Mr. Gehrman's fingernails, are you? Yes, I am. Okay. But you've heard the testimony. It's there, correct? I don't know if it was there or at what point it might have gotten there, sir. Okay. I'm not asking you how it got there. Are you really denying that your DNA is underneath the fingernails? Without knowing the truth, yes, I am. Okay, so that's your couch, right? That is my couch. And, and, and underneath, 
uh, your couch is a set of a shoe and a chopped up shoe, right? Right. Okay. Uh, that's that's uh, that's the gray Nike, correct? Here, so yes, sir. Uh, that's what it looks like, correct? Yes, sir. It's gray in color, correct? Yes. It is a Nike brand, correct? Yes, sir. It has a black swoosh, correct? Yes, sir. It has four horizontal or at least vertical bars in the middle of that shoe, correct? Yes, sir. All right. You would agree with me. That's the shoe that the killer was wearing, correct? I don't know that that's the case. You don't, I mean, I mean let, let, let's just look at it. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I don't disagree that it's the same model. It, right. It, it's the exact same type of shoe, right? Right. Okay. So we're not in dispute about that. We can agree on that, right? Right, yes, sir. And your DNA is in those shoes that are found in your house, correct? I don't know that to be the case. Okay, but that's the whole thing of like, it's a setup and I think the DNA people are framing me. Something along those lines, right? I really thought the trial was just fascinating to watch. Just based on those five minutes and knowing that there is so much more, what do y'all think? Do you think the jury got this right? Do you think that um, he really is guilty of murder? Or do you buy this Democrat politician's defense, which is he was framed by a professional assassin and that his DNA was planted in all these places to make it look like he actually killed this investigative journalist? Now, I, I'm, I, I'm not sharing this story to try to paint all Democrats as evil or all Democrats as, you know, uh, potential murderers of journalists. I'm, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that when it comes to media coverage of corruption in our government, and this, I get, is not corruption, but it is a wrongdoing, obviously, a horrific wrongdoing by a Democrat politician. And when it comes to Democrats doing something wrong, they, for whatever reason, get whitewashed in the media coverage. A former politician did this. A former politician did that. Versus whenever it's a Republican, they really, I mean, just notice this. And I, I guarantee you, anytime they don't mention the party affiliation in the title, you can guarantee it's a Democrat. Almost always. I'd say 99 times out of 100, that's the case. And if you start looking for it, you'll see it. And this isn't trying to be conspiratorial. It's not trying to uh, f make a mountain out of a molehill and find drama where there isn't any. I'm just saying that maybe, again, it's the bias of the journalist. Maybe it's the bias of the news organization. But it's a small bias that really can reshape and change the cultural narrative around the two parties. And that's why I wanted to voice um, uh, my opinion on this, because I think it's important for people to be aware that even tiny distinctions like that can really manipulate the public in large, large ways. Now, speaking of the media, speaking of media coverage, Sarah Palin is back in the news. For those of you who are longtime followers of the channel, I once was a huge Sarah Palin fan back in 2008, and then I thought she was going to run again uh, as president in 2012. Now, she had filed a defamation case, a defamation lawsuit against the New York Times uh, because she, Sarah, had put basically a bullseye on districts she wanted to target. But she put bullseye on bullseyes on the map, not saying, hey, let's go take these guys out. But no, let's these are the districts we need to target and flip through votes. It, there was nothing violent about it. But the New York Times essentially accused her of inciting the shooter against Gabby Giffords in Arizona. Well, Sarah Palin's defamation lawsuit was thrown out. Then it was appealed, it went back to court, it was thrown out, and apparently it's been appealed successfully again. So her case is going to court again for a third time, and maybe the third time is the charm. According to the New York Sun, Sarah Palin's third chance at justice, the Second Circuit, in a devastating rebuke of the district court, orders a new trial in the alert Alaskans libel case against the New York Times. Now, this was actually a lot worse than I thought. Um, so as you can see here, the, the decision was made yesterday, August 28th. But in this first red box, what they're basically saying here is that the judge single-handedly decided to throw the case out while the jury was still deliberating. That's why this case was successfully appealed, because the Second Circuit, uh, the three judges unanimously found that the judge acted inappropriately, was basically power-hungry, as, again, just read Reading from this, Palin's claim was subsequently tried before a jury, but while the jury was deliberating, the district court dismissed the case again, um, and they they explain why. Um, but the problem with that was that 
he basically ignored the jury, uh, ignored evidence, and ignored facts and in inferences that would have been helpful for Palin's case. In the second box that I've highlighted, unfortunately, there are several major issues at trial, specifically the er erroneous exclusion of evidence and inaccurate jury instruction and legally erroneous response to a mid-deliberation jury question. So again, um, I, I really hope the third time's the charm. I, I get that it's hard to win a defamation or a libel case, and I, I'm so thankful we have freedom of the press, but freedom of the press, you know, these media entities have to be responsible. They, they, they have to be held accountable, and I, I think that this is really a great news for hoping that one day conservatives and Republicans and, heck, independents will be treated fairly in the media the same way that the media treats Democrats. And maybe that's not the right way to view it because the, Demo uh, the media gives preferential treatment to Democrats. Maybe the better way to think of it is that maybe everyone will just be reported on fairly and accurately by the media. Now, yesterday, J.D. Vance went to a rally and he actually told Kamala Harris to, quote, go to hell. Um, it was a stunning rebuke by J.D. Vance. And, you know, I know some people don't like the vulgar language or the aggressive language, but I love that he is so impassioned and that he is being so direct and attacking Kamala Harris without doing any of the extra fluff, any of the extra personal attacks that gets Donald Trump in trouble. Take a look at this moment. But to have those 13 Americans lose their lives and not fire a single person is disgraceful. Kamala Harris is disgraceful. We're going to talk about a story out of those 13 brave, innocent Americans who lost their lives. It's that Kamala Harris is so asleep at the wheel that she won't even do an investigation into what happened. And she wants to yell at Donald Trump because he showed up. She can she can go to hell. I, I saw that clip going viral, and I just wanted to defend J.D. Vance because Democrats and all these influencers are, are basically talking about how vulgar he was and how inappropriate he was. And they're using the same attacks that they use against Donald Trump, saying that it, it, it's unpresidential and unbecoming of a presidential candidate. Well, no, if you want to talk about temperament, if you want to talk about unpresidential, what about what the Democrats are doing? They're name calling. They keep calling not just Trump and Vance, but all of us, they keep calling us weird. They keep bringing up the weird couch reference. They did it last week at the DNC. I mean, almost every other speaker, it seemed like, made a reference to a couch. How gross, how disgusting, how inappropriate, especially when you know not only is that story false, but it was completely made up and had no basis in reality. It wasn't like the Democrats were just exaggerating, you know, a, a story that had a little semblance of truth. No, the whole thing was made up from start to finish. And yet the Democrat Party still wants to keep talking about couches. Totally disgusting. And then they're the ones politicizing Trump's honoring of the third anniversary of what happened in Afghanistan. He was paying his respects. He was uh, wishing, giving well wishes and prayers uh, to the families, to, to the surviving members uh, and families and friends of, of the 13 killed in Afghanistan under Biden-Harris. And yet Harris is trying to turn this into a huge controversy. You know what? J.D. Vance is right. I'm, I'm just saying, I, I agree with him. Now, what's really ironic about Kamala Harris is, you know, she keeps talking about how evil Donald Trump is, and she spent the last four, six years railing against his policies. She's already stolen uh, the no tax on tips ideas. She's stolen the child tax credit idea. Now she has flat out just stolen the border wall idea. According to Axios, in case you haven't already seen this, Harris flip-flops on building the border wall. She is now campaigning that she will build the wall on the southern border. And that, of course, was Trump's signature uh, campaign slogan, build the wall in 2016. I mean, if she's just going to copy Donald Trump's policies, if she's just going to copy his ideas, why not just vote for the guy who has the good ideas? 
I, it blows my mind that people can't see through this. And what's scary is I, I, I was reading comments on my videos. So many of you have worked uh, in the service industry. Some of you still work in the service industry. And you guys were saying, first of all, uh, that none of you have made over $100,000 in tips. Um, and that's a reference to a Democrat saying that uh, that's what service industry workers make. So that was a lie because um, apparently most servers don't make that. And that's what I would expect. Um but that most people in the service industry right now, uh, according to people leaving comments on my channel, believe that this no tax on tips idea came from Kamala Harris. They have no idea that Donald Trump came up with it first. And apparently the entire industry, like the people leaving comments were saying that all their coworkers, all their other servers and uh, waitresses at the places they work are all buzzing about this idea. And they think it's Kamala Harris's idea. Uh, just sad. Uh, but that's what we have. Again, this if we want to pick a theme for this video, it goes back to media coverage. Because media coverage really, I mean, again, just going back to the original case, just even the headline can shape a narrative, can paint a picture that society embraces and that be, becomes enmeshed in our society itself. One last thing I want to talk about. There... Um, so Mark Halperin, for those of you new to the channel, and I believe like half my subscribers subscribed after I made this video, but a few weeks ago, I predicted the exact date, the exact day that Joe Biden was going to drop out. And yes, I understand a lot of people expected him to drop out, and Vivek Ramaswamy was the first to predict that Joe Biden would drop out. But I predicted the exact date, it was a Sunday, that Joe Biden was going to drop out. Now, I don't take credit for that, but I like to think that I have a good pulse on the sources I trust and the sources I follow. And the reason I was able to share that prediction with you was because of Mark Halperin. And I explained in that video why I trust Mark Halperin, so I'm not going to do that here. But Mark Halperin is back in the news because he is saying that he has seen internal polling and he's predicting, and again, this is the guy who was my source for predicting the exact date Joe Biden was going to drop out. He is now predicting that within two weeks, basically even before the September 10th debate, Kamala Harris might be polling just as bad as Joe Biden or even worse than Joe Biden based on the internal polling that he's seeing, polling that's not yet available to the public. I'm just going to let you hear him in his own words. There's some public polling already, there's more coming, and there's some private polling that suggests that nationally in the battleground states, she's not ahead. She might be ahead on paper, but well within the margin of error. And there's some battleground states now where I think Donald Trump's on this trajectory is gonna be ahead. And it may be, regardless of what happens in the interview, and regardless what happens in the debate, it may be that by the middle of September, when things have calmed down, when the Trump campaign have had time to prey on some of the weaknesses that I suggested, that he's ahead in all the Sun Belt states and ahead in Pennsylvania and competitive in Michigan and Wisconsin, which would be roughly where Joe Biden was before the debate with a single path to 270 electoral votes, the three Great Lake states in Nebraska, too. And that would be a scary position for the Democratic Party to be in from mid-September through Election Day. Yeah, so I think that is very encouraging news for Team Trump. I know there are a lot of people who think polls don't matter. And I, I get that sentiment, but I do think tracking the polls is important, A, uh, to see where the campaigns need to invest the most money. So if the polls are showing, you know, if the aggregate of the polls are showing uh, some battleground states are weaker than others, then the Trump campaign and conversely, the Harris campaign should be focusing on those battleground states. So I think it's useful for the campaigns. And second, it, you know, it obviously holds us over until Election Day itself uh, so that we're not just like up in the air, biting our fingernails, trying to figure out what's going to happen. But as always, all of this is just my analysis and just my opinion, and I would love to know yours in the comments below. Again, the question for this video is, what do you think about the jury's decision? Do you agree with the unanimous decision that the Democrat politician was guilty of murder, or do you buy his 
uh, his claim, his defense that he was set up by a professional assassin. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you haven't already, please be sure to give me a thumbs up. I know it's a simple thing to ask, but it really does help me in the algorithm to reach more viewers like you. Be sure to smash that subscribe button and to check out one of these videos.